Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, George Kushner here, uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeon from the University of Louisville. Where we have uh, Dr. Corey Resnick from Boston, the Harvard Systems, with us this morning also. We'd like to welcome everyone to the AO North America CMF webinar. And we are going to discuss techniques of maxillary and mandibular fixation. The Education Committee thought it might be a good idea with all of our new, uh, the programs starting July 1, to have, that have new residents participating, uh, seeing patient uh, for the first time perhaps, to talk on techniques of uh, intermaxillary fixation. And so we have some introductory slides, and then I will turn the talk over to Dr. Resnick, who is going to go into much uh, deeper uh, thoughts on uh, his recommendations or his thoughts on techniques of maxillary mandibular fixation. So next slide, please, Corey. Here are uh, pictures of us, just so you know who we are, George Kushner, and then Corey Resnick from, uh, from Boston are our two AO personnel for this course. And uh, Mackenzie Sandusky is helping us in the background. So thank you, Mackenzie, for all your help. Next slide. Uh, we always talk about disclosures. Uh, uh, Dr. Latham is our course evaluator, does not have any. Dr. Resnick does not have any. I, my uh, conflicts of interest really have no bearing uh, or relation to this talk whatsoever. So I think we're uh, all potential conflicts have been mitigated. Next slide. Uh, after this, you will get a link and you get a uh, one hour uh, CE credit. Uh, this is a one hour webinar. Uh, so just uh, look for your link afterwards to uh, claim your, uh, your credit. Next slide. Uh, just a word about AO North America. Uh, this is an independent nonprofit surgical society who's dedicated to helping the care of P, uh, patients with musculoskeletal injuries. We try not to endorse any product or commercial entities. And uh, you're gonna see different kinds of equipment from different manufacturers. And we're just trying to give you the best educational experience we can. Next slide. So why do we need to talk about techniques in maximal maneuver fixation. And it really, it's a basic tenet. Rigid fixation techniques in the dentate patient begin with rigid fixation of the occlusion. This can be trauma. This can be reconstruction. This can be corrective jaw surgery, such as orthognathic surgery. And we want to establish the premorbid occlusion as a baseline goal. So if you in a, a motor vehicle accident, you break your jaws, and we want to put you back to where you started. And there are many, many ways to, uh, that you can use for intermaxillary fixation. And the surgeon must decide the intermaxillary fixation technique. Uh, is it for intraoperative, postoperative? And so Dr. Resnick's going to show you a whole variety of techniques that you can, can, or can use for intermaxillary fixation. And, and my feeling is you have to have a lot of tricks in your bag when you're treating all customers. So anyway, we hope you get some uh, take-home points from this. Uh, and this is just a quick overview of the course. So Corey, next slide, please. Uh, every session, we should have some learning objectives. Uh, describe intermaxillary fixation techniques in the dentate patient. Discuss options for intermaxillary fixation. Describe options for post-operative or convalescent uh, IMF. And then develop algorithms in your hand. What's the best technique based on what I need for this patient? So uh, some pretty straightforward uh, learning objectives for this session, and we hope you, you get something from this. Next slide, Corey. We're, I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Resnick, who is uh, going to delve a little deeper into all this stuff. Again, if you have questions, type them in the chat box, and we'll try to answer them. And so without further uh, delay, I will turn this talk over to Dr. Resnick, and thank you very much, Corey, for your uh, help in this talk. Thanks so much, George and Mackenzie and the entire AO team for putting this together. I think this is a really important topic uh, to dive into and make sure that we all have great 
techniques in maxillary mandibular fixation, which is really the backbone of craniofacial trauma reconstruction type approaches. So this is something we all need to really be quite adept with. Um, and as George said, please, uh, as we go here, put some questions in the Q&A box. It would be really great to uh, generate some discussion um, and happy to stop along the way and try to address those questions as they come up. As George introduced, uh, I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. I work at Boston Children's Hospital uh, and the Harvard School of Dental Medicine and Harvard Medical School. And uh, as George also alluded to, uh, rigid fixation of the dentate maxillofacial patients really begins with fixation of the occlusion. So uh, even though it's tempting to dive right into open exposure and fracture reduction and plate and screw fixation and many of the techniques that will be highlighted in great detail in other AO courses, all of this management is based on occlusal relationships. And so the ability to put the maximum mandibular occlusion together is quintessential for the optimal uh, outcome in patients that have some dentition. And we have a myriad of options available for maxillomandibular fixation. And there are lots of terms for this, intermaxillary fixation, maxillomandibular fixation that are often used interchangeably. Uh, I'm going to use the MMF maxillomandibular fixation uh, to refer to all of these. Um, and you can see a long list of different options available to us. We'll go through each of these a little bit and hopefully generate some discussion as to why we might choose one versus the other in certain scenarios. What makes the ideal appliance for maxillary mandibular fixation? Well, of course, we want it to be easy to use and easy to place and remove. And we want to be able to use it for multiple applications. So as uh, George mentioned earlier, there are different reasons we might use maximum mandibular fixation. Sometimes it's for intraoperative use only, and we might remove all of the fixation at the end of the procedure once internal fixation has been applied. Sometimes we might be using maximum mandibular fixation as sole treatment. We might not be doing open uh, reduction and might rather be using the maximum mandibular fixation as the definitive treatment for the fracture. And sometimes we might use a combination of things, maybe some intraoperative uh, maximum mandibular fixation, but some post-operative training elastic uh, type of therapy to continue treatment. And so we want to have a technique that's versatile and can allow us to apply all of these different maneuvers. We want it to be just as easy to remove as it is to place. Um, oftentimes we might be placing maximum mandibular fixation in a patient that's sedated or under a general anesthetic, but we may not wanna to have to return to the operating room to remove it. So we'd like to have something that is easy to remove in an outpatient setting most of the time in the right scenario. And we don't wanna add complications in our maximum mandibular fixation techniques. Obviously all surgical approaches have the potential for complications and oftentimes MMF is the beginning of a greater surgical procedure. We don't want the MMF itself to have a broad range of complications that add to the procedure. Some of the great techniques that have improved our ability uh, to use MMF quickly and adeptly uh, also increase the expense of the procedure. Uh, and so that's something that depending on the scenario, depending on uh, where you live and operate, and depending on many hospital and patient factors might need to be taken into consideration is how much does this uh, application of MMF really cost both to the patient and to the hospital system. And then of course, we want the MMF to be comfortable. If we have lots of uh, wires that are you know, poking at the lips and at the gingiva, uh, and it's very hard for patients to tolerate, uh, that can be a really uh, difficult factor, especially if we're maintaining the MMF for a duration postoperatively. So these are just some thoughts about the ideal attributes of our MMF options.
And so how are we going to decide amongst the myriad of options available uh, which one is most appropriate? And I think one take home point is that we should not use only one technique. Every surgeon and every uh, hospital system should have the option to choose amongst these different techniques in the right scenario. And, and you might find that a particular type of MMF is going to be appropriate in a specific type of case or a specific patient or a specific management approach, um, but a different type might be ideal for another scenario. And so we really should learn several of these techniques uh, and have them all in our tool bag. A lot of the decision-making will be based on the fracture pattern. And that's because the fracture pattern may dictate uh, what we're trying to accomplish in this operation. Are we going to use the MMF as definitive treatment alone without an open deduction? And that might uh, have a lot to do with, is the fracture itself in the dental segment or is it proximal to the dental segment where some uh, dental occlusal control using MMF is just the start of the procedure, but we may not have real fracture reduction that occurs as a result of that occlusal change because the fracture is proximal to the occlusion, for example. We might have to consider the status of the dentition. Are we talking about a fully dentate adult dental patient uh, with a normal occlusion premorbidly? Are we talking about a fully dentate patient, but with a very abnormal occlusion uh, at baseline? Are we talking about a, a patient that has lost many teeth and doesn't have a normal dental occlusion to work with, or a pediatric patient in the mixed dentition or the primary dentition? Uh, so all of these factors will have a big influence on the MMF technique we choose. Again, need for elastic traction, and this may have to do with the fracture pattern or the approach that we plan to use, um, but particularly if we're talking about, for instance, a subcondylar fracture pattern where we might want to use some post-operative elastic traction, uh, we need to make sure we choose an MMF technique that can handle those elastics uh, and won't just loosen or break uh, over the period that we're using that elastic traction. Again, the operative plan, and we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the different techniques available and how bulky they are and how positioned they may be, such they, they might obscure our ability to make the incisions we plan or do the type of fracture reductions that uh, we're planning on using for that procedure. As I mentioned before, the cost uh, may play a role. And then, of course, there's a lot of surgeon preference and surgeon comfort uh, in these different techniques. And, and that's why I think it's really beneficial to become familiar with several of these, if not all of these uh, available techniques so that we can choose the one that's most appropriate for the best case. So the gold standard for maximum mandibular fixation has been and probably always will be the Eric Arch Bar. Um, this is what we should all be extremely familiar with and adept with uh, as surgeons treating maxillofacial trauma. The tools necessary for the Eric Arch Bars are relatively simple, uh, available in most institutions. Uh, and other than the exact Arch Bar itself uh, are things we would find in pretty much any surgical kit. Uh, luckily, the arch bars are quite inexpensive and easy to obtain, uh, so tend to be available in most institutions. And certainly, um, the first time you place an Eric arch bar, it can be uh, difficult and lengthy, uh, but with a little practice, the Eric arch bar placement technique should become second nature and should be quite quick. Um, you know, most adept maxillofacial surgeons that are placing these arch bars with relative uh, routine should be able to get these on in about 30 minutes or so uh, without um, it being too challenging. This is something that can be done even all by yourself, like in an emergency room setting uh, with you know, one provider putting these arch bars on. Uh, but really, 
works best in a team effort. If you can have two people uh, working together, this can go really, really smoothly. One passes a wire to the other, uh, the other passes the wire back to the first, uh, and then the wire is tied down as a team. Uh, it's really important as you're getting used to these arch bars to uh, think through how they're going to work and exactly how they should be positioned before you commit to their placement. Uh, there will be lots of beginner errors in using these, such as uh, leaving the arch bar a little too long in one area and then having to try to get back there and cut it shorter later on once it's secured, which is very difficult to do, or having it be too short and not go all the way back to the molar region where you really need uh, good fixation. Uh, so really thinking through the positioning of the arch bar before you commit to its location is, is super helpful. Uh, I've certainly seen uh, these arch bars placed upside down by, uh, by a few uh, early providers who aren't so used to this technique, uh, and, and that can be really tough because those lugs don't work upside down very well. So really think through how you're going to use this arch bar before you commit to its placement. Uh, but with a little practice, uh, this can go very smoothly. Uh, one small point that you can see on the right side of the image here is the use of, a, uh, I call it a pickle fork or a gauze pusher or whatever tech, whatever tool you, um, you term that, um, that has a little fork to push the wire down below the cingulum on uh, incisor teeth. Uh, that's really important because, uh, as you know about the shape of incisor tooth, uh, it becomes very narrow as it gets closer to the incisal edge. And if that wire is not under that thick portion of the cingulum, it's just going to slide right off and not stay tight. Um, so it's really important to make sure these wires are positioned tightly and tied down really tightly. Uh, arch bars are so wonderful because they're incredibly versatile. Uh, they can be used for tight intermaxillary fixation uh, during an operation or as definitive treatment or post-operatively um, using wires uh, that attach to the lugs of the upper and lower arch bar, uh, or even using elastics uh, that are um, attached to all those lugs throughout the arch bar to make tight intermaxillary fixation. Arch bars can also be used for post-operative guiding elastics. You can use the arch bar during the procedure for tight intermaxillary fixation as you apply uh, rigid fixation internally. And then at the end of the procedure, you can switch to a guiding elastic type of uh, technique uh, on the same arch bar uh, without having to change to a different MMF technique. So incredibly versatile. Uh, intermaxillary fixation screws uh, have become very, very popular lately um, because of their ease of use. Uh, IMF screws are really fast to apply. They're quite simple um, and they are also fairly versatile. With IMF screws, we're not going to get as tight of fixation as you would get with uh, traditional Eric arch bars. Uh, so they're not uh, quite as perfect for complex fractures, comminuted fractures, uh, fractures in multiple dentate segments. Uh, but for simple fractures, um, particularly ones where intermaxillary fixation is really only needed during the intraoperative components of the procedure and guiding elastics are not going to be necessary postoperatively uh, or postoperative maximum nibular fixation is not planned. Uh, IMF screws can, can really be a quick way to provide the necessary occlusal relationships. IMF screws are fairly simple to place. Um, they're very quick. Uh, they're usually used permucosally, but uh, they also can be used after uh, fracture exposure or um, exposure for orthognathic surgery or other techniques. They can be used um, uh, it, uh, directly applied to the bone uh, 
uh, after incision if they're not meant to be maintained postoperatively. Uh, they can be used for guiding elastics postoperatively, although that can be difficult, particularly for patients uh, to change these elastics over. It's a very long distance typically to go from one IMF screw for, to another, and it can be a little difficult to stretch the elastic that far uh, and get it to be anchored on those screws. So patients sometimes have a, a harder time with that uh, if they're changing changing the elastics themselves uh, than if you have something like an Eric arch bar where the lugs are much closer together. Uh, but they certainly can be used uh, for post-operative guiding elastic uh, therapy in the right scenario. And as I mentioned, uh, they can be placed transmucosally or they can be placed uh, directly in, uh, in to the bone after uh, exposure uh, as long as they're not planning to be maintained after the procedure is completed. IMS screws can be pretty dangerous though. It's very important that when they're placed, you're looking very closely at the angulation of the root around the teeth uh, nearby, uh, using radiographs to see if there are abnormal root positions or shapes that you may not anticipate um, because you can cause damage to teeth uh, by putting screws right into them. There is some tactile sen sensation with these screws, so you may be able to tell uh, as you become more adept at using IMF screws, if you're about to uh, put that screw right into a root, you might be able to feel the difference between uh, medullary bone and root structure, um, but you certainly can cause a lot of damage to teeth and sometimes even lead to the need for endodontic treatment or, or even tooth loss uh, as a result of IMF screws. So. They should not be um, used without caution, uh, and it's certainly important to, to think through the positions of the, the root structure around the area. Uh, also possible to put these screws right into the mental foramen uh, or in other danger zones. So really important when using these IMS screws to, to think through the anatomy of the area to make sure that they're not causing any more harm than good. Hybrid arch bars are sort of a combination of the first two techniques. So using the concept of the Eric arch bar, um, but the fixation approach uh, of the IMF screw uh, to try to provide the best of both worlds, give more lugs for intraoperative MMF use and for postoperative elastic therapy uh, to try to improve the ability to really get a complex uh, occlusion uh, reduced more so than a series of IMF screws alone might do, uh, but to speed up the process so that uh, it's not necessary to use circumdental wires around each tooth, uh, but rather a series of IMF screws uh, to maintain the arch bar. And so that's where the concept of hybrid arch bars have come along. They are now produced uh, by all of the major companies uh, that we tend to work with for our fixation. And so uh, they're readily available uh, when we're working with other fixation kits. Um, each company has a, their, a different design and you may decide that one is a, a little bit better than the other in your hands, but all of them uh, are relatively similar in their concept. They're certainly uh, a little bit easier to place and faster to place uh, than typical Eric arch bars. Um, but they have some of the same, um, you know, risk as using IMF screws alone. It's very important to make sure that you understand the root anatomy of the teeth around the area uh, where the nerve canal sits and such so that we don't cause damage uh, when placing those IMF screws. One really big uh, detriment of the hybrid arch bar is its bulk and its position. Uh, it's much larger and bulkier than a typical Eric arch bar would be, and also its position much higher for the maxilla or lower for the mandible uh, in the vestibule than an Eric, Eric arch bar is. The Eric arch bar, as you've seen in those photographs, uh, sits right against the actual crowns of the teeth, whereas the hybrid arch bar tends to sit higher up or lower down in the vestibule away from those teeth. It depends very much on your operative plan, whether that's a benefit to stay away from the teeth um, or a detriment. One thing that I find a lot with hybrid arch bars uh, is that they 
are positioned in such a way that they make it very difficult to make necessary incisions for access. And even if you can make your incision around them, uh, by the time the case is completed and some of that mucosa has retracted a bit, it can be really difficult to close those incisions uh, as that mucosa sort of sinks underneath that arch bar. Um, so I very commonly combine these techniques. Sometimes if I'm dealing with a mandibular fracture um, that I feel a hybrid arch bar might work well for, I might use a hybrid arch bar for the maxillary arch where I'm not planning any incisions and then use a traditional Eric arch bar or some other technique for the mandibular arch so that I don't obscure my ability to access the vestibule and make those incisions. Uh, so we really need to think about it how the use of these techniques is going to influence the remainder of the upcoming procedure we have planned. Another um, detriment of the hybrid arch bar is that it's extremely expensive. Um, these arch bars, you know, elevate the expense of your case by literally thousands of dollars. Um, sometimes these arch bars uh, can go, can be $2,000 in cost, whereas uh, an Eric arch bar and the associated wires uh, for placement are literally pennies. Um, so this may be a big factor in your hospital. It might be a major factor in dealing um, with fracture patterns in, in more rural environments or places where expense is uh, really a consideration in the, in the ultimate case. And again, as I mentioned before, you're, you're not saving the use of the IMF screw by using the hybrid arch bar. The same um, risks apply in the potential to cause root damage or other harm uh, by the placement of those screws. But hybrid arch bars uh, can really be wonderful. Uh, here are two different companies' versions of those arch bars, uh, and they can really uh, speed up the case in certain scenarios and provide excellent both intraoperative and postoperative intermaxillary fixation. Um, just a quick video of how to apply a hybrid arch bar. This one um, happens to be the Synthes arch bar called the Wave. Um, and you know, starts by shortening the arch bar uh, as necessary. Really important to make sure that before you start applying it, uh, you make sure you have it adjusted properly. Um, and then it uses IMF screws just like would be used on their own. And this is a little plier that's used to spread or um, contract the arch bar so that it fits properly, which is helpful as you try to navigate the um, holes in the arch bar to make sure that you can apply those screws without causing root damage. Uh, this one, in the wave system does allow you to expand or contract the arch bar a bit uh, to try to get those holes positioned where you want them to cause the least possible damage. And so um, I do like this particular one, although the uh, other arch bars, hybrid arch bars available are also excellent. Um, hybrid arch bars can be very helpful when you're dealing with only a partially uh, maintained dentition. Um, because, of course, they don't require circumdental wires to hold the arch bar in place. Uh, so in a fracture like this one, uh, where we're missing a whole segment of dentition, uh, the application of those arch bars using the alveolar bone as anchorage rather than the dentition as anchorage uh, can be super helpful. So that's one scenario where the hybrid arch bar actually offers something that a traditional Eric arch bar just can't achieve. Um, another technique that's really useful and probably underutilized, I would suspect, um, but really a great one to add to your tool bag if you're not familiar with it, uh, is the Risden cable. Um, Dr. Kushner really, really loves this in primary uh, dentition fractures, and I do as well, um, but it's not specific to primary dental fractures. This can be used in the adult dentition as well and really... Um, pretty much any time you would otherwise use an, an Eric arch bar, uh, you could use a Risden cable instead. Um, even though I've mentioned the Eric arch bar as requiring very little specialized equipment, uh, the Risden cable requires even less. Uh, 
uh, all you need to create RISD and cable uh, is just some 24 or 26 gauge wire. And it's the same concept as an Eric Arch bar, uh, but it's even lower profile because instead of using the preformed Eric Arch bar with its associated lugs, um, the same wire that's used for application of the cable is also used for fabrication of the cable. It's just a twisted wire um, that creates uh, that very low profile connection between all of the teeth and then is applied with a series of circumdental wires to hold it in position. It works extremely well uh, and really is helpful, particularly in the primary dentition where the clinical crowns of the teeth are very, very short. Um, the teeth themselves may not have very long root structures. And so real good application of the cable against the teeth without the rigidity of the air arch bar probably applies less stress to the, those primary tooth roots. Uh, to be able to connect the maxillary cable to the mandibular cable with those small uh, clinical crowns and without the bulk of the Eric arch bar uh, or some other application technique. And the application after the uh, cable is, connect is created and applied to the posterior components of the dentition is really the same as applying the Eric arch bar. Um, except that with the Risden cable, the application circumdental wires also become uh, what are used for the intermaxillary fixation component or the elastic uh, components rather than having um, separate lugs on the arch bar as the Eric arch bar does. Um, but the Risden cable is very versatile, just like the Eric arch bar is in that it can be used for uh, intermaxillary wire fixation. It can be used for post-operative guiding elastic uh, usage uh, and certainly a combination of both techniques. So it has that same advantage of versatility as uh, the Eric Arch Bar does. Um, and then we'll start getting into some of the techniques for sort of a quick, mostly intraoperative use type of MMF. If we're trying to um, reduce a relatively simple type of fracture, uh, particularly with a good starting dentition, and um, we want to find a technique that's very quick uh, and very simple, easy to place and easy to remove, um, then we can use some of the following types of techniques like Ernst ligatures, ligatures, excuse me, for example. Um, and then if these aren't strong enough uh, for your intermaxillary fixation, you can even use some acrylic to add strength to them. The technique for placement of Ernst ligatures really looks very complicated uh, when you, you know, look at it in this type of schematic. Um, but when you try it a few times, you'll find that once you sort of sort out the concept, they go incredibly quickly and they're very, very easy to apply. Um, so really just have to follow the technique a few times until you sort it out. But uh, it's as simple as placing something like a 24 gauge wire around a um, canine or premolar tooth and then having it come circumdentally around that tooth and then back around the tooth just behind or distal to it um, in such a way that you can then thread that wire, um, those wire ends uh, over the loop and both provide fixation around those, you know, uh, around that pair of teeth uh, and also a um, point to add other wires or other um, elastics to, to provide the intermaxillary fixation. So they're, when you get adept at them, they're very quick to apply, very quick to remove, um, very inexpensive, and they work really great for intraoperative fixation in patients with good dentition and simple fracture patterns. Um, here's just a, a appearance of the Ernst ligature uh, that's also been fixated from the maxillary one to the mandibular one to provide the intraoperative fixation necessary for fracture reduction. And a similar option um, that's also very quick to apply and uses only wire uh, is the IV loop, 
I think the purpose and utility of the Ivy Loop is very similar to the Ernst ligature. You probably choose between them just based on um, your preference and your experience with these, but they have uh, very similar concepts. Um, this one is just applied slightly differently by uh, creating the loop segment prior to uh, threading the two wire ends interdentally, um, but then those wires come around the tooth, uh, both uh, proximal and distal to the entrance point, and then thread back through that wire loop for the fixation component. Uh, but in most ways, they work very similarly uh, to the Ernst ligature approach uh, to provide very quick um, intraoperative maximum manipulative fixation, uh, mostly for good dentitions and simple fracture patterns. Uh, and here's what you might see on a uh, series of Ernst ligatures, or sorry, um, Ivy loops um, that are actually used as definitive treatment uh, for this fracture pattern that was not otherwise reduced um, open. Um, here's what it looks like when they're just used in the uh, posterior dentition for post-operative intermaxillary fixation. And then Gilmer wires is, a, is an older technique uh, that also has some of the same advantages of something like Ivy loops or Ernst ligatures, again, using very simple components, just wire and, uh, and a wire twister. Um, this time actually going around uh, each tooth separately as you would do if you were fixating a Risden cable or an Eric arch bar, uh, but now using the remaining uh, wire after the fixation around the dental segment uh, to actually provide the intermaxillary fixation between the arches. Um, so another very quick and easy to use type of technique for intraoperative uh, fixation. Uh, again, another one of these techniques, the embrasure wire, uh, also good for quick intraoperative uh, fixation in patients with good occlusions primarily. Um, this does rely on the um, contact points between the teeth to be very tight. These wires um, really tug on those contacts and may slip through the contacts in patients without a very good dentition. So really have to choose patients appropriately for this type of approach. Um, but this is a way to get intermaxillary fixation during an operation very, very quickly and simply uh, in the right patient with a good dentition and tight dental contacts. Um, and then there are some uh, you know, fancier versions of similar techniques. Uh, these are kind of a, an elevated version of the embrasure wire. They use the same concept of the embrasure wire, um, except without using wire and instead using um, a you know, much gentler type of uh, approach. And one of the theoretical advantages here is that there aren't uh, going to be um, sharp wires that might cause patient discomfort post-operatively. Uh, rather, everything is smooth and elastic so that um, it's much more comfortable for the patient. Uh, but also, these are going to be a lot more expensive um, and a little bit harder to find in the average armamentarium uh, in your hospital unless you order them specifically. Um, so not quite as readily available uh, as something like an embrasure wire might be. Um, but certainly has some advantages uh, in their rapidity of application uh, and their comfort. And here's what those uh, ties look like um, when they come out of a package um, and you can get them in different sizes uh, based on your planned application. Here's uh, what they look like when they're in place providing intraoperative intermaxillary fixation. And then uh, orthodontic appliances can also be used in certain scenarios. Uh, I personally don't find the application of 
traditional brackets uh, and orthodontic appliances that useful uh, in common fracture reduction. Uh, there are scenarios where a patient might already be in orthodontic treatment at the time of their injury, uh, and then I might choose to use the orthodontic appliances that they already have in place for some components of fracture reduction or postoperative elastic wear. Um, I personally find that orthodontic appliances that are not as part of full treatment, meaning not just the the actual braces themselves, but also with an arch wire connecting all of those braces um, can be a little bit dangerous, particularly with post-operative elastic traction, um, because they will actually move the teeth. All of the other uh, applications that we've looked at um, utilize some fixation around the uh, alveolar bone or directly to um, the basal bone, but don't rely entirely on the tooth crowns um, for the fixation technique. As we know from actual orthodontic treatment, if we put a brace on the tooth and then give three weeks of elastic traction against that brace, you will get some um, actual fracture reduction from that, but you'll also get some tooth movement from that. Um, and so I think that can be a little bit dangerous in changing occlusions in a way that we're not intending. Um, if we have a full arch wire, so someone that is in active orthodontic treatment at the time of their fracture, the arch wire uh, may mitigate some of that. So it might be useful in that scenario, but I tend to avoid applying orthodontic uh, brackets um, for typical fracture reduction uh, because of that potential tooth movement associated. But uh, in the right scenario, uh, this could be useful. And then there are some special cases, uh, particularly um, in edentulous uh, fractures in adults, uh, where you might use uh, gunning splints. Uh, these are not used as commonly in the modern era as they used to be um, when we didn't have as great internal fixation techniques available. Uh, but these still can be useful in certain scenarios uh, where we have an edentulous fracture and we use a, a denture fabrication type of process uh, to determine the position of fracture reduction and maybe even as definitive fracture reduction, as you can see in the case where there are some circumandibular wires or circumzygomatic wires uh, that hold those gunning splints in place and the splint itself uh, becomes the technique for fixation. Oftentimes in the edentulous fracture nowadays, we may be using anatomic fixation or anatomic reduction, I should say, uh, as our guide and perhaps avoid the gunning splint technique. Uh, but this is still a great technique to understand. And, and there are some other advantages to understanding this type of approach, uh, even if not particularly in the trauma scenario. For instance, the um, edentulous are partly uh, partially edentulous orthognathic surgery patient, uh, where creating some form of a gunning type splint uh, preoperatively may be very useful in determining the position you might choose um, to move the maxilla and mandible uh, during orthognathic surgery uh, using the planned final prosthesis as your guide for the final outcome. So uh, understanding the technique for fabrication of gunning splints and similar uh, items can be very useful uh, as a technique in our armamentarium. And then in a similar vein, um, I am a pediatric oral and maxillofacial surgeon, and so I actually frequently do use um, lingual splints as definitive treatment for pediatric mandibular fractures, and I find these quite useful. Um, similar concept uh, to a gunning splint, um, but it avoids the need for plate and screw fixation in, for instance, a mandible that has a tremendous number of developing teeth uh, that I would really like to not cause any harm to. Um, so in a fracture of a pediatric mandible in the primary or early mixed dentition, you can uh, create a splint based on some dental modeling uh, and apply that splint with circumambular 
wires and use that as a few weeks of definitive uh, treatment for that fracture. It works incredibly well, but the, uh, the main disadvantage is just in the application or the creation of the splint itself uh, and how you might um, accomplish that in your institution based on your resources. Um, because most of the patients in whom this would be applicable uh, may not be able to have traditional dental impressions or even um, a digital intraoral scan performed uh, while awake, you might need to obtain the dental information necessary to create this splint uh, during an anesthetic. Uh, and so then the question becomes, is, is there going to be a series of anesthetics necessary, uh, one to get the dental information necessary to create the splint and then another one to place it? Uh, or do you have the ability to fabricate a splint uh, very quickly using an in-house lab or your own um, uh, printing techniques uh, very quickly during that same anesthetic. So there are some uh, technique and um, uh, and uh, you know institutional uh, requirements in order to be able to make these lingual splints. But if they can be done in an appropriate fashion, uh, they can work incredibly well. Um, and so I thought at this point, uh, we could maybe look at a few different types of fracture patterns and hopefully open up some discussion uh, about why certain types of maxillomandibular fixation might be more or less appropriate in those scenarios. Uh, and also uh, maybe answer some questions uh, that you all have posed. So um, I'll pause for a second and uh, see if Dr. Kushner would like to uh, have a look at our Q and A section. Uh, we got three questions, Corey, uh, and the first one is: How do you manage a palatal fracture? Which I'm not sure is the topic of this discussion. Uh, so I might just maybe put that off until a little bit later. But the sure. yeah. question we have is: Do you prefer three or four? or more IMF screws per arch. Somebody yeah. come, you decide to use IMF screws. What is your thought pattern? Yeah, good questions. And um, I don't know that there is a you know definitive right or wrong answer to any of these, probably a lot to do with preference um, and fracture pattern. So um, on the IMF screw question, you know, when I'm determining how many to use, uh, a lot of that decision making has to do with the status of the dentition uh, and the position of the fractures that I'm treating. So um, if we're talking about using IMF screws for, uh, uh, for instance, a, an angle fracture, um, maybe not the bilateral version that we're looking at here, but a unilateral angle fracture, for example, um, and I'm planning to use those IMF screws only for intraoperative use uh, while I do some open reduction and internal fixation of that angle fracture, for instance, the Champy technique as an example. Um, and there are no fractures uh, throughout the dentate segment, and we're dealing with someone uh, with an expected fairly normal occlusal relationship pattern, uh, I think three IMF screws per arch is probably sufficient. Uh, I would like to have one that really controls the posterior occlusion, so I usually try to get them uh, somewhere around between the first or sorry, between the second premolar and first molar region uh, on each side, and then one pair in the midline. Uh, and I find that that works quite well uh, for intraoperative fracture reduction. Um, if it's a scenario where there is a fracture in the dentate segment, let's say a symphyseal or parasymphyseal fracture, um, then I actually might be thinking about four screws um, because I really would like some screws to span the fracture itself um, and provide some fixation that's somewhat proximal to the fracture, as well as two more, so that means maybe two screws around the fracture itself, um, and then another two screws more posteriorly to control the posterior dentition. Um, so I think that decision has a lot to do with the fracture pattern and the status of the occlusion. But I think in a, in a good occlusal relationship scenario uh, where there are not a lot of fractures in the dentate segments, 
um, and I'm planning to use them only for intraoperative fixation, then three screws is often sufficient in my hands. Um, and then, yes, I agree, Dr. Kushner, the palatal fracture question is a little bit beyond uh, dis today's discussion, although I will just say that when there is a palatal fracture, it's going to be much more important, and this doesn't apply only to palatal fractures, but other complex fracture techniques. Um, I think it's be, it becomes much more important to have more extensive occlusal control. So I, I think the concept I would say about that is the more complicated the fracture pattern, the more I start thinking about tried and true old techniques like Eric Archbar's um, or something that really creates um, a very strong occlusal control scenario. I think as the fracture pattern um, gets more complicated than some of the more sort of quick and dirty techniques like a few IMF screws or some embrasure wires or ivy loops or something like that um, might be less advantageous and, and more control is helpful. Great, Corey. Can we, I'm going to move on. There was a the next question uh, regarding uh, edentulous fractures. It's a, the question is, what does he mean when he notes anatomic reduction, full reduction of edentulous fractures rather than the gunning splint? Does this mean just reduce the fracture visually in edentulous patients as exact reduction is not as important? Yeah, really good question. Um, very nuanced answer, I think, depending on the uh, you know, patient scenario and their pre-morbid situation. Things like, uh, are they currently wearing dentures um, prior to their um, fracture? Uh, in which case, you may choose to use their existing dentures like gunning splints or as gunning splints, um, as opposed to sort of creating their own gunning splints, for example. Um, what, uh, you know, the fracture, the, the need for fracture reduction has, uh, uh, perfect anatomic reduction has a lot to do with, you know, the height of that mandible, uh, whether you might need um, some bone grafts to help support optimal healing, uh, whether you're talking about uh, mini plate fixation or because it's a very uh, short edentulous mandible, we may be thinking more um, rigid fixation with reconstruction plates. Um, and anatomic reduction of the fracture patterns means seeing visually the fractures align properly um, rather than using the dental segments to control the position of the fractures um, becomes much more important uh, in a dentulous fracture than it would be in a dentate fracture. Um, but maybe Dr. Kushner has something to yeah. add. To that scene. I'd like to jump in real quick on that. I, we got a fair amount of uh, experience with dentulous fractures here in Kentucky. And I have not made a gunning splint in years. I think this is more, uh, for, more for historical purposes. We found out that uh, these edentulous patients do much better with an open reduction, uh, anatomic reduction of the fracture, rigid internal fixation, and immediate function. Okay. I, I'm going to move on. We've got a, a couple more questions, Corey, and I'd like to finish up our questions if we could. Please. It said, uh, would you mind going over your method of applying circumandibular wires? Sure. Um, so circumandibular wires are something very interestingly that um, I used to be very unfamiliar with as I was training. We just used them so infrequently. Um, and there's something that sounds very scary or difficult about them. So when I was uh, first in practice, particularly in my pediatric environment, where I think they are, I might use them a little bit more frequently than um, in some other scenarios. Uh, I was very intimidated by circumambular wires, but it turns out uh, that with some simple techniques and thoughtfulness, uh, they're incredibly simple to use um, and very predictable. Um, really, you only need two instruments to do them. You just need your wire itself and you need an instrument called an awl, um, which I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of to share at the moment, but uh, can be easily found in Google, I'm sure, um, which has uh, a curved component with a, a little fork at the end that's sharp uh, and a hole in it where the wire itself can be fixated to the awl. Um, you then go under the mandible in the position that you would like the, um, the wire to be inserted, 
make a very small incision, uh, typically with a blade. I think some people may do this percutaneously without an incision, but I certainly prefer um, to make a small incision uh, so as to have you know, really good um, soft tissue structure around that area without uh, damaging it with that wire. So just a very small puncture incision. And then just as you would, for instance, if you were draining a submandibular infection and you were using um, uh, uh, some instruments to palpate the inferior border of the mandible to know where you're headed to try to drain that abscess, for example. It's the same type of technique uh, where you attach the wire to the awl, uh, just thread it through the loop, and a very um, quick turn. You don't really want a long threaded turn. It's hard to remove, but just enough that it will hold that wire securely to the, to the loop of the awl, and with the wire attached, the awl is inserted through your incision. You palpate uh, the inferior border of the mandible. So you want the, the awl to hit that mandible and then thread it. And it's your preference, which you prefer to do first, whether you come lingually or facially, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you know where that all is by palpation and you just slide it right along uh, the border of the mandible in one direction or the other. And then if you're going lingually, which is, tends to be my preference for the first pass, um, then you just have it slide up the lingual border of the mandible, have it really curve around the mandibular shape so you're not heading out into the floor of mouth, into the tongue base, into the submandibular um, duct area um, into danger zones. You're really just hugging the lingual border of the mandible right behind the teeth, and then the all pops right through the mucosa. You grab your wire um, and detach it, and then do the same thing a second time with the other end of that wire uh, going on the facial surface of the mandible. Um, and then you have your two wires uh, extending into the mouth uh, on either side of the mandible. And then of course you do that as many series of times as you need wires and then just twist them down as you would any other fixation technique. All right, thanks, Corey. I'm gonna go, uh, there's a question from Dr. Lee. He, he had two questions. I'm gonna kind of combine them together for you. He wanted to know the specific steps in dealing with mandible fractures. Do you do MMF first based on the occlusion expose the fracture, reduce it, plate it, and then release MMF? Or do you do your incision, expose the fracture site, put them in occlusion, place the fixation, and then release the MMF? Yeah, great question. Um, not sure there's an, a universal answer to this. I'll just tell you my preference, but that doesn't, um, but I think there are variations that would work quite well. Um, my tendency or my preference is to place the intermaxillary fixation appliances as the first step. Not necessarily actually place the patient in IMF, but let's say I'm using an, a set of Eric arch bars, for example, or a combination like I mentioned, I often do of a hybrid arch bar on one arch and an Eric arch bar on the other. I will place those arch bars as the first step in the procedure typically. Um, but I may not apply the intermaxillary fixation to those arch bars. So typically I'd have a, my set of arch bars um, in place, then I would expose all of my fractures. And then I would start to, you know, place the MMF um, on that set of arch bars uh, as I get the fracture reduction and fixation going. That, that's my preference. Uh, you know, Corey, I think you're right. There's many ways depending on the, the dentition, the occlusion, the severity of the fractures. There's many ways to skin this cat, and I don't think uh, there is a right or wrong way. I will say if you're trying to get the patient in MMF and you're struggling, I think the smart move is to open the fracture. Then you can look at it and kind of reduce the fracture and put them in MMF at the same time. Yes, absolutely. I do, uh, I do. Uh, you know, as I said, I put the, the the application of the arch bars or whatever I'm using first, but I tend not to try to actually reduce the fracture at the clusal level uh, or place the patient in the tight MMF that I might use until after I've then exposed the fractures and can manipulate them so I can see the fracture reduction as I'm placing the MMF. Excellent. Moving on, we have a question about, can you guide us more on elastic traction 
some books suggest two elastics on each side for correcting malocclusion. Um, you know, again, I think this is much, very much a preference thing and it has to do with um, the type of fracture pattern and the goal of reduction. Um, I tend to use a lot of elastic traction when I'm dealing with subcondylar condylar fractures and trying to um, train uh, the occlusion uh, to eliminate um, deviation or a unilateral open bite that's resulted from them, but I've dealt with the dental segment separately or there wasn't a dental segment fracture. Um, I often will use two elastics on each side in that scenario, uh, but I really judge, you know, intraoperatively or during the treatment process, how the elastics are functioning. I think um, in some kids or other patients that, um, uh, you know, apply one a strong elastic on either side and really reduce very readily with that, that may be very sufficient. Um, so I tend to use two to start out with, but I sometimes lighten that up to one on each side in the right scenario. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, margin of error is relatively narrow in avoiding the tooth roots with screw placement. Any other tricks on identifying root position? Yeah, that's a tough one. And that's one of the reasons why I think we have to be really careful with IMF screws and maybe even choose other techniques if we're not sure or com comfortable with them. Um, there's not a great way to know where all those tooth roots are going to be in some scenarios, except for using the, the tools that are available, which are the radiographs we already have. You can look at your radiograph and see if there's some abnormal root anatomy. You can see if the, the roots around, say, the premolar teeth where you might be putting that IMF screw diverge or converge. You know, if you can see that those roots really converge on your radiograph, you might not put an IMF screw there or just choose a different technique. Um, depending on the type of scenario I'm using these screws, particularly if I'm using them just for just for intraoperative use and not planning on maintaining them, then I might try to put the screws either higher or lower in the vestibule um, so that they are either above or below where I expect the tooth roots to be. Uh, or they are at least at a point where the tooth roots have diverged much more uh, than when they're higher up closer to the tooth crowns. Now that may be harder to maintain postoperatively um, because if they're deep in the vestibules, then soft tissue tends to grow over the screws and such. So they're not really maintainable in those depths for the longer term. Uh, but if I'm using them just for, you know, half an hour of fracture reduction, uh, then I often try to just stay away from where the roots might be altogether. All right, moving on. I, I know we're at 11 o'clock. I'd just like to answer a, a couple of questions if we could, if we don't mind. Uh, could you please tell me any sophisticated techniques other than lingual splints in pediatric patients? And uh, Corey, I may, I may just jump on this. Uh, I, yeah, I know you see a ton of kids and I see a ton of kids too. Uh, kids heal incredibly well. And I, my plea for more conservative treatment, lingual splints are great. I think a lot of the kids can be treated very well with closed reduction or closed management with, uh, you know, arch bars, uh, RISD and cables, uh, training elastics, uh, circumandibular wires. Uh, in, you know, you can use them to hold the lingual splint in, or you can use circumandibular wires to help reduce and fix that, fixate that fracture for a short period of time. Uh, on real bad, we've had some real bad dog bites. We've had some gunshot wounds to kids, unfortunately, that required plate and screw fixation. But uh, Corey, any other thoughts other than that? No, I mean, I think I agree with that general philosophy. I think um, when dealing with pediatric facial fractures, particularly mandibular fractures, definitely uh, I take a, a less is more type of approach. Um, there are times in those really complicated cases, the dog bites, the, the, the um, you know, gunshot wounds and such, uh, where open reduction really is required. So I wouldn't say I would universally avoid it, but I would I will say that working in a level one pediatric trauma center, um, the number of times that I open 
real pediatric fractures. And when I'm saying pediatric, I mean, you know, four or five, six, seven year olds. When we get into 12 and above with permanent dentition, I would say I think a little differently about it. But in the true um, pediatric world, I rarely open mandible fractures. Um, closed reduction tends to work quite well. Uh, and also you have to take into consideration the scenario, um, how, how displaced is the fracture in the first place? Um, does it even require reduction? Uh, oftentimes if it's very close to an anatomic position and we're dealing with a, a child that's um, going to heal in days or weeks, um, you might be able to really do very minimal uh, treatment at all and expect very good healing and the alveolar bone discrepancy, as long as it's minor, um, will be uh, accommodated for with normal dental eruption that follows. Um, so I, I definitely would avoid aggressive treatment in pediatric patients, but I don't know that there are um, any great sophisticated techniques to share um, beyond the ones that we've discussed here. I think it more has to do with um, you know, the philosophy of fracture management that definitely is different in that early pediatric population compared to what we do in adults. Great. Thanks, Corey. And the next question is, isn't the professional name of an owl an introducer? And I, I think uh, it's all, A-W-L, and there's a mandibular all, and there's also a zygomatic all, which is a little bit longer, but it's, it's not owl, O-W-L, it's A-W-L, and I think if you look in the equipment catalogs, it's there's two. There's a mandibular awl and a zygomatic awl. Uh, Corey, I'll go uh, question about bridal wires. Do you place bridal wires uh, in your fractures? Um, depends on the fracture pattern, but I often do. I really like bridal wires, um, particularly in uh, a fracture that's not comminuted, um, that's right in the dentate segment. Uh, I find that placement of a bridal wire is incredibly useful in, you know, gross fracture reduction. It may not uh, obviate the need for more reduction, um, although it might in the right pattern. Uh, but I find that the bridal wire is super useful and I use it frequently. Um, I often place the bridal wire as one of, if not the first step uh, in the operation. Uh, prior to placement of other uh, MMF techniques, uh, prior to uh, opening of the fractures, uh, I find that just stabilizes the scenario and, and can be super helpful. Uh, you do have to be a little bit careful with them, particularly if there are root fractures of the teeth around those areas, or if the, the dental segment is, is very mobile, uh, then you can you know, cause some luxation of the teeth by using them inappropriately. But I think in many scenarios, uh, bridal wires are super useful. Okay. Uh, any role or use of Leonard buttons in MMF? I'm going to jump in. I'm not sure what a Leonard button is. I know there's Kazanjian buttons. There's, there's all kind of variations where you can take a, a wire, wrap it around the tooth, make a rosette. So I'm not 100% sure exactly what a Leonard button is, but uh, you can use them for elastics. Uh, Corey, do you know what a Leonard button is? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna move on. Uh, uh, next one might be a bit of a difficult question. When do we use class two or three elastics in dealing with condyle fractures or with cross bites? And I, I'm, uh, you know, I think uh, it, it all depends with this one for me to answer it with any kind of certainty. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't have a, um, a protocol there of how those elastics are placed. I often, it really just depends on the fracture pattern. I often try to make my guiding elastics, um, you know, vertical, um, without a clear class two or three position. Um, but it completely depends on what you're using those elastics to achieve. Um, so, you know, I might use a sort of, you know, class two elastic pattern if there's a left, on the right side, if there's a left sided condylar fracture and I'm trying to um, pull the mandible around that corner over toward the right side and make it lengthen on the left side. Um, but it's very specific to the fracture pattern for me. 
it. Uh, what is the management of screw inserted into a tooth root accidental? Well, um, I just remove it and inform the patient and watch it. And um, often there are times where there are, you know, tooth root injuries from uh, IMF screws or other things that don't manifest into a problem. Some, some of those teeth actually do just fine. Um, I just, I think we just need to make sure that patients are aware that there's the need for follow-up evaluation, uh, maybe communicate with their, their primary dental providers uh, for follow-up evaluation. And, you know, if there's an ultimate uh, need, then there might be more treatment necessary. And I'm going to jump in on this one. I've seen everything from a tooth that required absolutely no treatment. It was just an incidental observation to the tooth. In other ones, required root canal. And we've actually seen some teeth shatter, which required extraction. So uh, you can see the whole gamut depending on how much that tooth is damaged. Yeah, I will say as you get more adept with IMF screws, there is a tactile difference between a tooth root and normal bone. Um, so you may still run into a tooth, but hopefully you can avoid uh, creating a, a, you know, a really bad dental problem by one, if you feel that tooth root repositioning before you keep going. All right, uh, can we get a recording of this lecture? I can tell you this lecture is being recorded and I think it is available uh, through the uh, AO uh, North America CMF website. Uh, question about bad effects of the, on roots and periodontium when wired around root necks. I'll answer this quickly. For normally, for a short period of time, you know the gums may get inflamed, et cetera. But normally, it's not a long-term problem. Uh, intermaxillary fixation, arch bar has been used for an awful long time. Uh, so I think the the, tran the effects, the ill effects, are transient. I'm going to jump down. This one's a good one for you, Corey. Uh, what is your opinion on MMF duration in pediatric population? Should it be shorter than adults? And then MMF for unilateral or bilateral intracapsular fractures in children and adults. Yeah, uh, I definitely use shorter durations of MMF for real pediatric patients, you know, um, six, seven, eight to 10 year olds or so. Uh, they heal so quickly. I usually do three ish weeks. Um, there's no absolute right or wrong protocol for that and no science behind the timeline, but I definitely shorten the duration um, for kids, both because I think they heal faster and because I really want them to return to function faster. Um, I really don't want them to um, develop TMJ ankylosis, which of course can happen at any age, but I think in the pediatric population they're particularly prone to, um, which really is the same uh, concept as the other the follow up question. Um, for intracapsular condylar fractures, I would never use tight MMF. I think it's really important in that scenario to, for in a pediatric patient in particular, um, to get function back as soon as possible. The, the worst complication of that fracture that can occur is TMJ ankylosis. And as we all know, that's a really terrible problem. Um, and in a pediatric patient with a you know still growing condyle, um, we've got to get that moving immediately. So um, I often try to avoid any type of fixation. If we, if necessary for occlusal relationships, I might do some guiding elastics in that scenario. Um, but if I can get away with it, I'll do no elastic, nothing at all, because I don't want to do anything that eliminates um, function. And in fact, my, my instruction to the family is usually, you know, we're not going to do anything to fixate this fracture what I want you to do is go home and make sure your kid's opening and closing his mouth 25 times a day. Okay, I, I agree 100%. I don't, uh, I function, 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 especially in pediatrics. I'm gonna move on. Uh, are you able to remove the hybrid in clinic or mostly in the operating room and any tips for removal in clinic? And I'll, I'm gonna jump in with that real quick. Local anesthesia, uh, you can either, uh, give local anesthesia in the vestibule and remove these very easily in clinic, provided you have a screwdriver. Uh, I, I, have to, I actually often do it in clinic without local anesthesia. 
I, I sometimes find that patients have found the, you know, um, the stimulation of the injection of local anesthesia to be worse than just unscrewing a few screws. It's really quite painless, honestly. Yeah, and actually I've used some cetacane spray or just some topical yeah. in the office. But uh, the one thing is, got to have the screwdriver. So if you they come to office, you, you got to make sure you have a screwdriver in, in your office. But I think you can avoid if you have any kind of a cooperative patient, avoid taking them back to the OR to remove that. And we routinely remove Eric arch bars in clinic uh, in the same situation. Yeah, likewise. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, we're gonna. Give, there's questions about dislocated condylar fractures. I don't think that's uh, related. To, to this, and then when do you remove circumambular wires and pediatric fractures? I'll let that's our last question. Uh, I'll let you answer that one, Corey. Um, well, of course, I remove them when when their necessity is done. Um, which you know, usually if I'm using something like a lingual splint, uh, I probably will keep that for about two to three weeks, uh, which is when I would remove the circumambular wires. The circumambular wires, of course, are a little bit more difficult to remove in an outpatient setting um, without an anesthetic. I think uh, the real utility for something like that is in a child who might be hospitalized for a while because of some other um, comorbid or, or other related trauma scenarios. And is, for instance, say on an inpatient unit uh, where it's very simple to uh, provide a little Versed or something at the bedside and then remove them in that scenario, I might be able to do that without requiring a full general anesthetic. Um, but it's going to be tough to take, say, a six-year-old and have them walk into your office as an outpatient and remove those circumambular wires. I agree. All right. Well, folks, we are, it's 11.15. We've run over. I'm, I'm glad we were able to answer a bunch of the questions. Uh, Dr. Resnick, I'd like to thank you. Great presentation, great discussion. Uh, Mackenzie, I'd like to help you with running the AV stuff. And with this, I'm going to bring our talk oh. close. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I was supposed to show this video. Can I do yep, that? Go ahead, show it real quick, Corey. Yeah, real quickly, for, for those of you interested, um, if you really want to learn a lot about computer-aided maxillofacial surgery, which is really the, the, the current and future cutting edge, uh, there's a great AO course to attend in Florida, another Hello. good place to be I'm in November. From AOCM and Faculty for North America. I would like to personally invite you to join us for an exciting course this November in Tampa, Florida. Computer-Aided Maxillofacial Surgery with Bioskills Lab and Human Anatomic Specimens. Maxillofacial reconstruction is constantly evolving, and surgeons are developing treatment plans for increasingly complex conditions. You won't want to miss this unique opportunity for hands-on experience with cutting-edge next-generation tools that are literally changing the face of maxillofacial reconstruction. These include 3D printing, pre-surgical planning, intraoperative navigation and CT, as well as virtual and augmented reality applications. We have assembled an outstanding faculty of world-renowned experts. They will work side-by-side -side with you in the Bioskills Lab, forming complex orbitozygomatic, fibula free flap, orthognathic, and craniofacial reconstructions. It's gonna be a great course. Excellent, okay. thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Corey. Great job. And uh, I hope uh, everybody has a great rest of their weekend and a great summer. Thank you, all. Thank you very much.